The year is 1805. The War of the Third Coalition is raging on. France, under the rule of Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte, is fighting a massive war in both land and sea against the nations of Austria, Russia, and Great Britain. A huge army of seven French military corps, a total of 200,000 men, were stationed at Boulogne. They were known as the Grande Armée. For months, the Grande Armée trained for a planned invasion of Great Britain. Napoleon frequently visited the army camp to oversee the training and provide updates on the invasion plans. Unfortunately for Napoleon, a huge British fleet blockaded the coasts of Europe, preventing him from transporting his fleet into the territory of Great Britain. If Napoleon wanted to invade the British Isles, his naval forces would need to take control of the English Channel. The British fleet was commanded by Admiral Horatio Nelson. He was Britain's most daring naval commander, having previously crushed the French at the Battle of the Nile. Nelson knew that Napoleon would attempt to break the blockade. He needed to somehow lure the French fleet into battle. Nelson decided on a loose blockade of Europe in order to bait the French into battle. Nelson made no secret of the fact that he planned to use unusual naval tactics in any future engagement with the French. At this time, the French navy was scattered across several ports in Europe. They needed to unite to give the Grande Armée a chance at crossing the Channel. Napoleon devised a cunning plan to break the British blockade and secure the English Channel. He quickly sent orders to Admiral Pierre Villeneuve, who commanded a huge combined French and Spanish fleet. Following Napoleon's orders, Villeneuve sailed to the Caribbean and back, successfully evading Nelson's blockade. The British fleet chased Villeneuve as he made these maneuvers. After the French fleet returned, Napoleon sent orders to Villeneuve to sail towards the port of Brest so that the French could commence the invasion of Britain. But after a minor defeat at the Battle of Cape Finisterre, Villeneuve feared that he was being lured into a trap, and contrary to Napoleon's orders, sailed towards the coast of Spain, docking in the harbour of Cadiz. British Admiral Nelson pursued the French fleet. Napoleon now had no opportunity to swiftly invade Britain. He took the Grande Armée to fight the forces of Austria and Russia in the Ulm campaign. Napoleon was angered by Villeneuve's refusal to follow his orders, and arranged for a new Spanish admiral to replace Villeneuve. When Villeneuve heard of this, he knew he had to act swiftly. His entire career, as well as the fate of a successful invasion of Britain, rested upon Villeneuve's ability to rescue the French fleet from their dire situation. The stress of the situation only hardened Villeneuve's resolve. He gathered all the captains of his fleet for a meeting to decide what to do. A fierce argument erupted between Villeneuve and several of his Spanish captains, who chastised him for refusing to listen to their advice in the past few weeks. During the argument, Villeneuve angrily declared that it was impossible to make any complex plans with such a disorganized fleet. He then abruptly stormed out of the meeting. The fleet's vice-admiral, a Spaniard named Federico Gravina, approached the disheartened Villeneuve and convinced him to return to the meeting. Gravina told Villeneuve of the rumors that British Admiral Nelson was going to attempt an unorthodox strategy in his next battle. Gravina believed that this information presented the perfect opportunity for the Franco-Spanish fleet to triumph in battle. With this in mind, Villeneuve happily committed to the idea of a battle with the British fleet. Over the course of the next few weeks, Gravina and Villeneuve then reorganized the fleet's chain of command, reprovisioned every ship with fresh supplies, and taught as many sailors as possible how to maneuver their ships and make use of their cannons. The Franco-Spanish fleet that left Cadiz was a revitalized force. Once Nelson heard that the French and Spanish fleet had left Cadiz, he immediately ordered his own fleet to intercept them. A few days later, the two fleets met near Cape Trafalgar. The British fleet had 27 ships of the line ready for battle. 
Nelson had come up with an ingenious plan to engage the French fleet. Most naval battles at this time were fought by fleets arranging themselves into rows and firing on each other. But instead, Nelson arranged his fleet into two lines of ships, expecting that they would crash through the French ranks in the midst of battle and rout the helpless French and Spanish ships. This strategy was a huge gamble. The fleet's formation could not be changed easily once the battle started, but it was a gamble Nelson was willing to make. Nelson commanded the northern half of the fleet, aboard his flagship the HMS Victory. Vice Admiral Collingwood commanded the southern half, in his own flagship, the HMS Royal Sovereign. But Villeneuve expected this. He and Gravina had long since prepared to counter Nelson's unique strategy with one of their own. Before the battle began, Nelson sent a message to all the ships in his fleet, telling them, England, England expects, expects that every man, man, man do his duty. Do. Around the same time, Villeneuve sent a message of his own to his fleet, saying, Liberté, Liberté Egalité, Egalité fraternité. fraternité. These words were the motto of the French Revolution from years before. Later that day, a British officer informed Nelson that the French fleet had been sighted. When Nelson went above deck to take a look, what he saw horrified him. The Franco-Spanish fleet was organized into one massive straight line, facing the British fleet. Villeneuve's flagship, the Bucentaur, was positioned near the front of the fleet, while Gravina's flagship, the Principe de Asturias commanded the fleet's rear. The largest warship in the battle was the famous Spanish vessel known as the Santissima Trinidad. The French and Spanish fleet totaled 33 ships of the line. Once the British fleet came into view, Villeneuve ordered his ships to move to the north of the British fleet. This was a genius move. The British northern flank was vastly outnumbered and outgunned by the French. The southern half of the British fleet could not assist in the battle without firing on their own ships. Now sensing the perfect opportunity to strike, Villeneuve ordered the entire fleet to open fire. Cut off from any support from the rest of their fleet, many British ships were incapacitated by the overwhelming French cannon fire. In the next few hours, nearly half the British fleet was obliterated. In the midst of the fighting, a French cannonball struck the HMS Victory, killing Admiral Nelson. By this time, Vice Admiral Collingwood had moved his ships to support Nelson. But it was too late. The entire French fleet was now positioned to fire on Collingwood's ships. Admiral Gravina's ships pounded the remaining British ships with cannon fire. Sensing an imminent disaster, Collingwood ordered the remaining British ships to retreat from the battlefield. But the direction of the winds now prevented the British from fleeing southward. The only place to go was in the direction of the French fleet. Collingwood prepared his ships for a final standoff with the French. He gave orders to his fleet to try and sail past the Spanish line. At the same time, several French ships assaulted Collingwood's rear engaging in boarding actions. In the ensuing battle, a French sniper shot Collingwood in the head, killing him instantly and demoralizing his crew. The French soon captured Collingwood's flagship, the HMS Royal Sovereign. Upon seeing the Vice Admiral's flagship fall, many of the remaining British ships simply surrendered. Nelson's gamble had failed dramatically. The Battle of Trafalgar was a decisive French victory. 
The Allied French and Spanish fleet had lost no ships, while capturing 20 ships of the line. The British, on the other hand, had lost their entire fleet. Villeneuve had broken British naval supremacy. The British could no longer afford to maintain their blockade against France, and ordered all of their ships to return to the English Channel, fearing an imminent invasion by Napoleon. At the same time, Villeneuve blocked the Straits of Gibraltar, preventing any remaining British ships in the Mediterranean from escaping. The French and Spanish fleets then began to systematically hunt down the scattered British ships that remained in the Mediterranean. This was a disaster for Britain. With the destruction of Nelson's fleet, there was now no large naval force protecting the English Channel. But the British were lucky. Villeneuve's diversion to Trafalgar had ensured that Napoleon could not invade Britain that year. Instead, he took the Grand Armée to fight the combined armies of the Third Coalition in the Ulm Campaign. Napoleon managed to eventually crush his opponents at the Battle of Austerlitz, where he annihilated the armies of the Austrian and Russian empires. The Austrians were now forced to negotiate. In the resulting Treaty of Pressburg, Austria left the war, with Emperor Francis granting many concessions to Napoleon. In London, news of the coalition's twin defeats at Trafalgar and Austerlitz prompted many in Parliament to demand peace with France. But British Prime Minister William Pitt refused any idea of peace with France. He spoke of how Napoleon's armies now ran Europe, and the threat they posed to Britain's position of French power continued to grow. Pitt proudly proclaimed that he would never make any concessions to Napoleon. For years, the British had been planning to defend themselves in the event Napoleon landed an invasion force. There were nearly 50,000 British regulars present on the island of Great Britain, with another 18,000 in Ireland. The government had also spent months recruiting and organizing tens of thousands of reservists for war. Furthermore, thousands of militias had organized across Great Britain, ready to fight a guerrilla war if the French landed in southern England. Many fortifications had also been built along the English coast. Pitt quickly sent orders for the regulars to staff them. The commander-in-chief of the British army, the Duke of York, Prince Frederick, assembled an army nearly 90,000 strong in southern England, composed of regulars, reservists, and militiamen. Meanwhile, Napoleon sought to immediately take advantage of his victory at Trafalgar. The British withdrew their forces that were occupying Naples and Sicily, leaving the entire area defenseless. French forces quickly moved in to capture the region. Almost all of Europe was now under France's control. The astounding success of the French army convinced Napoleon that it was once again possible to invade Britain. He sent a letter to Villeneuve, commending him for the excellent victory, and promising that Villeneuve would now remain as the highest ranking admiral of the French navy. Napoleon now restarted the plans for an invasion of the British Isles. He sent out messengers across Europe, demanding that ships and supplies be sent to support the invasion. At the same time, Villeneuve had taken the ships he had captured from Trafalgar to the French port of Brest. At Brest, Villeneuve, Gravina, and French Vice Admiral Gantom oversaw the repairs to these captured British ships, staffing them with new crews and cannons. Famously, the French repaired Nelson's flagship, the HMS Victory, which had suffered extensive damage during the battle. Now, the victory was known as the Victoire, and it would serve as a vital component of the French invasion of Britain. In spring 1806, Villeneuve led a massive armada of 84 ships of the line to the English Channel. It was by far the largest naval force in the Atlantic. They easily defeated a small British fleet in the area. After this, Villeneuve moved to attack the Channel Islands. They fell in a matter of days. The path was now clear for the Grande Armée to cross the channel. Over the course of the next two weeks, the French fleet began transporting the Grande Armée onto the shores of England. In 
Napoleon personally led the invasion. The Grand Armée landed at the towns of Chatham and Sheerness, which were near the city of London. Almost immediately, local militias began attacking French foraging parties, killing many of Napoleon's men. But Napoleon pressed on. The Grand Armée was only a four days march from London. But the French were slowed down by the vast array of fortifications built across England. Frederick now moved in to block Napoleon from reaching London. The British commander-in-chief gathered his officers to decide what to do. Most of Frederick's officers advised immediately attacking Napoleon before any reinforcements could arrive. They wanted to rout the French and avenge the Battle of Trafalgar. However, one of the officers, an MP by the name of Arthur Wellesley, the Duke of Wellington, cautioned against acting swiftly. He advocated for letting Napoleon wear himself down in Kent and southeastern England, only attacking once the French army had been weakened by guerrilla war. Frederick chose to attack Napoleon immediately. He wanted to buy enough time for the government to evacuate London and crush the French before they gained a foothold in England. But Napoleon's army moved at an astonishing rate, coming close to London. The two armies met near the town of Dartford, just outside of London. The battle began with both armies lining up outside of Dartford. The Grande Armée outnumbered the British nearly two to one. Napoleon's plan was to use his overwhelming numbers to tie up the British army, while one of his marshals, a man named Davu, worked to get around the enemy flank by going through the town of Swanley. Frederick's goal was to try and delay the French advance for as long as possible. Intense fighting ensued, with Napoleon's soldiers releasing volley after volley of gunfire. The French onslaught was relentless. British forces suffered heavy casualties. Eventually, French Marshal Davout managed to surprise the British flank. In the fighting that ensued, Frederick himself was killed. Chaos ran through the British ranks. Many regiments of regulars were routed. A local militiaman relayed these developments to Wellington. Wellington then took charge of the situation, rallying as many troops as he could and successfully withdrawing from the battlefield, with small militia groups covering his retreat. The battle was a decisive French victory. The road to London was now clear. Soon after the battle, Napoleon received news that a revolt had erupted in Ireland against the British authorities. The United Kingdom was falling apart. But not all was lost for the British. The battle at Dartford had bought Prime Minister Pitt enough time for him and his government to escape to the English Midlands, where they planned to continue the war effort. Napoleon then ordered the Grand Armée to march on London and fulfill his dream of conquering Britain. <laughs>